have a special guest with us today, a man with great experiences and interesting stories. Jim Corcus, Disney historian and author of The Vault of Walt. Thanks for joining us today, Jim. How has your um, stay in Storm Lake been? Oh, well, thank you for asking me, Bree. I've just had an absolutely wonderful time, so I'm glad I have an opportunity to tell people how much I've enjoyed the hospitality. and It's, it's just like a little piece of paradise put in, in the middle of Iowa. This is my first time to Iowa, and um, I'm learning an awful lot. Um, you see cornfields, great. You're probably like, oh, this is an awesome place. And you've been shown around town, right? Well, well see, again, I, I uh, grew up in uh, Glendale, California, and uh, then moved to Orlando, uh, uh, Florida. And so I didn't get a chance to, to see any of this stuff except in, in picture books or in paintings or whatever. And it's much more beautiful and fascinating in person th than it is, you know, um, anywhere else. I, I think a lot of people should come to Iowa. There's a, there's a, a lot of things here for them to, to do. The Meredith Wilson Museum, the Bill Baird uh, Museum and all that. And, and again, I've got to say, very, very friendly and hospitable people. And, and I've seen that at the university. Great. We love having you here. But we want to know about your background. Like, Tell us about yourself. Set us up. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, moved out to uh, Glendale, California when I was about five years old. And Glendale, California is a small town. It's right next to uh, Burbank, which is where the Disney uh, studios are. So uh, between the ages of 10 and 12, I was a big fan of Disney animation. And I would watch the cartoons and I would write down the names on the credits. And then I would go to the Glendale Burbank phone book and I would phone them up, you know? How did you make that move? What? <laughs> and uh, fortunately, my parents were very supportive. And at first, many of these people thought, well, this is a joke. This is a kid and he's making a joke. Uh, but uh, when they realized that I was actually interested and passionate about this, uh, they would invite me over. So I would go over to these uh, houses of animators and Imagineers and they would talk and they would teach me how to draw and, and tell stories. and um, so in junior high, I, I would uh, write these down and submit them to the uh, school newspaper, and it was picked up by the local newspaper, and then I was submitting to uh, magazines, and before I knew it, I was a writer, and I was a Disney historian. Um, so it, it was a, a, a great deal of, uh, of fun. Uh, but uh, again, there were a lot of different career pathways in, in California before uh, I, I became the Disney historian that I am today. Mm -hmm. Weren't you ever scared to just call someone up? I don't think I would be able to call someone up and ask them about their job, especially, I'd be nervous they were on, they were in the credits of a movie. Well, and, and, and that's, it, that's interesting you say that because I don't remember being, I'm more nervous now <laughs> talking to you than I was uh, talking to them because uh, as a kid it was like, I need to know this information. And, and they didn't have the... Uh, a uh, vast variety of, of books and resources and yes I'm old enough that there was no internet in those days so but these were the people who had the information so you go to the people who had the information I think one of the things that helped is a couple of the first people that I talked to were so kind and so supportive that it just didn't occur to me that oh my gosh it would be wrong to do this I, I was appropriate I called during an appropriate time I didn't call like at midnight or at eight o'clock <laughs> in the morning but uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great question. But no, I had no fear at that time. And you've been through, I was, you sent me some stuff, and you've been all over the board as far as careers, even in Disney World. Can you explain some of those to us? Oh, yes. Uh, all of that was to uh, impress women. <laughs> and when they weren't impressed, I'd go on to a, a, a different career. So uh, I was a writer, but I was also a uh, performer and um, uh, earned a nice living as, as a performer. Uh, I was on the gong show with my two brothers as uh, singing, dancing hunchbacks, the Quasimodo Bel Airs. <laughs> uh, Quasimodo, do you know who's gonna win the third race? No, but I got a hunch. <laughs> and I was on uh, the dating game with my two brothers. Uh, so they had a stunt woman from uh, Universal Studios Hollywood who was trying to find a date. And we were just, the three of us were just goofing around uh, over that, so uh, when we watch the tape now, we can see her eyes go, what have I gotten myself into? This is terrible. <laughs> and on the um, uh, Family Feud, I was on a game show where I actually won a um, Cadillac 
because I was able to answer the question, do fish get seasick? Do they? Yes, they do. And fortunately, <laughs> I had read that right before I showed up at the game show. So for them to do that, that was amazing. So my brothers and I uh, grew up uh, doing an awful lot of entertaining. Uh, when I graduated uh, college, um, and I'm sure none of the college audience can relate to this, I really didn't know what I was, wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to be rich and famous and have cheerleaders throwing themselves at me. But those listings weren't in the classifieds. So uh, fortunately, I had a backup of a teaching degree, and so I went into teaching. So I taught uh, junior high school for um, uh, several years, which was a real eye-opening experience. But uh, fortunately, a, a teacher's schedule gives you plenty of freedom. So uh, in the evenings and during vacations and on the weekends, I'd still do uh, entertaining. I'd still do uh, uh, writing. And um, I learned magic. I learned magic. And uh, I performed that at uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain and also uh, several uh, different venues, the Variety Arts Theater, which is a very prestigious old theater in, uh, in Hollywood and all of that. But uh, I also did some cartooning. I was a cartoonist for two uh, local newspapers. And people go, oh my gosh, this guy must be 90 years old. Look at all these <laughs> things. But I was doing all of these things concurrently. So I was writing and all of that. And people always ask, well, which do you prefer doing? And I always prefer doing whatever it is I'm not doing at the moment. If always, I'm always, of course. Of always, of course. You're absolutely right. Uh, when I'm writing, it's like, oh, this is so lonely. I, w I wish I, I was involved with people. And then I do entertaining, and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. Why did I decide to, to do this? I've got butterflies in my stomach. I wish I was teaching that safer. And then I do teaching, and I go, nobody's listening to me. Nobody's paying attention. <laughs> I'm going to go back to writing. I've got control, all of that. So, yes, all over the map. But I think all of that experience adds uh, uh, to what you're eventually going to do. And uh, Walt Disney, it, it was the same thing. When he was uh, um, 19 years old, he had uh, six different jobs in one year, and he was fired from all of them. But all of that experience he got at those jobs paid off later in life. One of those jobs was loading people onto the uh, elevated train in Chicago. And so he had to uh, uh, configure people so it, it was easy to get the most people on uh, and the most people quickly on to the elevated train. And mm -hmm. so he's going, I want to be a cartoonist. Why do I need to know how to control crowds and how they would operate, you know, in a line and all that? Well, paid off when Disneyland opened. And you worked in Disneyland with a different, a couple different things. Um, well, more than a couple, actually. Uh, you were a performer, and you did some, um, I remember reading some stuff about ba Magic Kingdom, like random points and stuff that were <laughs> very interesting. Um, what were those like? What, oh, what uh, else did you do there? Well, uh, actually, it wasn't Disneyland. It was Walt Disney World. Because, because Sorry, Walt uh, Disney No, World. Th that's fine. People confuse it all the time. And in fact, the big joke in California was I was the most Disney person they kn knew, and I was not working for Disney. <laughs> uh, I did not officially work for Disney until uh, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I went out to Florida to take care of my uh, family, my mom and dad, because they had some health problems. I figured uh, I could always get another job, but not an another mom and dad. Uh, so I started out at um, Pleasure Island, which is at downtown Disney, and it's a... Uh, nightclub area and, and restaurants and, and shopping. And what I was doing was I was doing uh, magic and uh, balloon animals for drunk college students. So I, they would come up and they would go, uh, make me a balloon hat with 50 balloons. <laughs> uh, and then they would throw up on my feet. But, and, but as a Disney cast member, you just smile. Oh, thank you. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. I did that for about three months, and then they moved me over to the Magic Kingdom, where I was uh, uh, Merlin the Magician, looking for the new temporary royal ruler of Fantasyland. <laughs> and on the weekends, Rush Picture Pet and Frontierland, an old gold miner. <laughs> By golly. And uh, those were called face characters because you could actually see their face. When you have a Mickey or a Minnie or a Baloo, that, those are called fur. Um, and so that, that was very exciting. 
And uh, during that time, uh, the Disney Institute opened, and that was offering uh, specialized classes uh, for people who wanted to come to Disney. So classes on animation, classes on how Disney does horticulture. Uh, um, and so I applied, and because of my background in, in animation, and with cartooning, I got a job as an animation instructor at the Disney Institute, mm -hmm. and I taught classical animation and um, computer animation, uh, stop motion clay animation. I taught a class called Voices of Disney, where I taught people how to do different voices, and we would record them and, and play that back. Uh, the Disney Institute was um, always undergoing changes, and so during one of those changes, I moved over to uh, Disney Adult Discoveries, which was uh, writing and uh, facilitating backstage tours for guests and for convention groups. And then eventually I moved over to uh, Epcot, where I was a coordinator with college and international uh, program students, because in order for them to maintain their visa or to get college credit, they had to take a certain number of mm -hmm. classes, so they thought this was important. And um, then I moved into the Disney Learning Center, which was sort of a computer lab, uh, and uh, uh, assisting uh, cast members there with how to use the computer, and also doing presentations on Disney history. I developed uh, 300 different presentations on Disney history. And I will tell you that all of the ones that I'm doing for Storm Lake are brand new. They are different than the 300 that I, I developed uh, for that. And uh, Although that seems like, oh my gosh, he jumped around all over these places, that's actually a, um, uh, a very routine career at Disney is they are constantly moving you around into different areas so that you get a wider perspective of, of the company there. And how many voices do you think you can do? <laughs> just how just, many? Uh, well, gosh. How I, many you, did you have to teach? How many did I uh, yeah. have to teach? Well, what I taught was I taught um, voice placements. There are 10 voice placements. Uh, the hero voice and the nasal voice and all of this. And then when you combine all of those differences together, you can get all sorts of uh, uh, different uh, voices. You know, you can get uh, Mickey. Ah, oh, gosh. Gee, Bree, thanks for interviewing me. <laughs> and Goofy. Oh, gosh, thanks. Well, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm coming back to Iowa. Uh, Donald Duck. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, you, you can go through that. Uh, I also did a lot of voiceover work for, uh, for uh, uh, Disney. I was the off-camera narrator for a TV series called Secrets of the Animal Kingdom, where I was the off-camera na narrator and the voice of a dozen different animals and um, did narration for a lot of uh, uh, Disney videos. So... But you know, that's of all the times I've been interviewed, and I've been interviewed an awful lot, you are the first person, the first interviewer to go, well, how many voices do you think you can do? And you know what? I don't have an answer because I never sat down and, and uh, kept, track of them kept, all. kept track of them all. Uh, I, I just know there are other voice artists who have much wider range, but my gosh, I've got to think. When, <laughs> Just out of curiosity. I'll, 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 I'll give you a phone call from okay. Florida. Oh, by the way, the answer to that is... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, how do you become... You are a Disney historian. Yes, I am. And how, how do you get to there? Oh, well, you know, uh, you climb Mount like Everest every... <laughs> and, 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 you know, they, they blindfold Walk you and yeah. dip you in. Um, actually, Disney historian uh, Leonard Malton... Uh, was a writer about uh, old movies, classic movies, and, and all of that. And so he would identify himself as a old movie writer, and everybody thought, oh, well, you must write the screenplays for the movies. No, I write about the movies. And so Leonard uh, came up with the term uh, film historian. And Leonard's written a lot of great books, including the Disney films. And Leonard is a, a, a friend that... Um, uh, I uh, met in California, and so uh, I was starting to write about animation, and I was described as an animation writer. Oh, what shows do you write? Well, I, I actually supplied some uh, uh, scripts for the Smurfs, but I was write not an animation writer, so I became an animation historian. And then when it focused on Disney, I became a Disney historian. And today, there are a lot of people who are identified as Disney historians, and the requirement is that you do uh, a lot of original research, that you are published 
and that you are recognized by other Disney uh, historians as uh, this is a reputable source. And oftentimes, um, I'm a little different than most Disney historians because most Disney historians have a narrow focus. They're, they're only interested in Disney during World War II or they're only interested in the theme parks or they're only interested in Disneyland. Uh, I have a broad interest in, in all of that, Disney music, uh, Disney history, and in fact, what I'm doing here in uh, Iowa is I'm connecting um, business aspects with, with Disney. So um, I know a lot about a lot of different things, but sometimes I don't have the depth of knowledge in a particular topic that some of these others do. But you've done a lot of research, you a lot, a lot of research, I can't even begin to imagine. And well, it actually was quite easy because I had no girlfriend and no life. And so when you don't have that, you know, you, you go out and do something else. My brother actually said he hoped that I never get another <laughs> girlfriend. And I said, why is that? He says, because when you get a girlfriend, all of this knowledge you have just dribbles out your ears and you're of no use to me whatsoever. <laughs> But I had a lot of time, and, and, and again, it was fun. And you, and you should do things that you're passionate about because you will spend more time at work than you will with your family. That's statistically true. So you better find what you enjoy doing because life really is very, very short. Well, your latest book, the Vault, I mean, you've published other books. Yes, correct? actually, I, I've written uh, several. Uh, uh, this is the first book that I've written all by my lonesome. I had a writing partner, John Cawley, who was... Uh, uh, one of the producers of the original Garfield TV series. And so we wrote several books about uh, animation, Cartoon Confidential, How to Create Animation, uh, the Encyclopedia of Cartoon Superstars that were uh, well received. Um, uh, we're still friends, but we went, we were going on different pathways mm -hmm. and all that. And uh, I s was spending a lot of time taking care of mom and dad, so I didn't have a lot of time writing. Once they passed away, uh, worked on this book, uh, The Vault of Walt, 400 pages, almost 40 different stories about Walt and the theme parks and animation and film and miscellaneous stories like how the FBI was investigating uh, uh, Walt over the Mickey Mouse Club. And the point was to try and write stories that didn't exist elsewhere in Disney books. Sometimes in Disney books, uh, Walt Disney's life was so rich Sometimes they could only mention a sentence. And so these are the stories that come between those sentences that people didn't have room or time or knowledge to write. Uh, Diane Disney Miller, who is Walt's surviving daughter and wrote the introduction to the book, I was very, very flattered. She said, you've written things about my father that I never knew. She said, I grew up with him I, and all of that and I'm supposed to be the authority on my father. You know things about my father I had never heard before in my entire life. Thank you. <laughs> and you have you have so many stories, like you said. Mm -hmm. What? How did you find those things out? What were the hardest stories, the most intriguing stories to write about? And and again, you know, it's it's tough to write about Disney because there's an awful lot of urban legends about Disney, and people um, repeat these things as if they're true. You know, oh well, Walt Disney is frozen. No, he is not frozen. <laughs> Walt was actually cremated, and there's documentation. I found documentation for that, but a lot of people think he was frozen because uh, the family just had a very private funeral, so there were only six, seven people there, so nobody saw. Walt in the hospital because Walt didn't want people to see him in the hospital. Nobody saw him lying in state. So it's like, oh, well, he's still around. You know, he, he's frozen. So the tough thing about doing a Disney, uh, writing about Disney history is finding uh, the information. So I'd have to go back to original sources. So I would dig out newspaper uh, uh, articles. I would interview people who uh, uh, were there at the time. And again, even when you're interviewing people, you better be careful because they may have their own agenda to make themselves look better than they are or they may have a, a faulty memory because brain cells are dying and and here I'm asking them well what happened 40 years ago and if they asked me what I had for lunch yesterday I don't know if I could even answer that question so you do a lot of that research you do a lot of checking all of the stories in the book uh, every individual fact I, I made sure that I had at least three separate sources that would confirm that because an awful lot of times people say things and you just accept it as it's true because somebody says it with such authority it was like I've got to write this for two reasons first off all those interviews that I did 
Some of those people are long gone now. This is the only chance for their voice to be heard, their story to be heard. But also for future researchers, get this material because it's disappearing. Right. It doesn't exist anymore. And you checked, you checked your facts, so you have everything for the future. I mean, there are probably more stories that we still don't, you can't, you couldn't publish because you didn't have enough um, background information. You on them. are absolutely correct with that. You are absolutely, uh, how sharp you are. Yes, absolutely correct. Uh, I had some stories about the making of Song of the South, and they were absolutely, but I couldn't confirm them. Fortunately, I have since been able to confirm them, so if I do a second book, a sequel, I'll be able to include that. I am very proud of the fact that the book came out last October, so it's been about uh, almost a year now, and in that time, nobody has mentioned any factual error in the book. And, and that's tough, too, because when you write, it gets out of your hand. It goes to the publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes, and, and so typos appear and, and things like this. And oh my gosh, I read that book so many times <laughs> that I started to dislike that book because I had, <laughs> do I have to read this again just to make sure there were no typos, all of that was as correct as it could be. And how long did it, all of this take? How uh, long did it take oh, well, to write? Well, what time is it now? Oh, I, I tell wall. people it took me 30 years to write the book mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that encompasses all the research and the planning and all that happened. But the actual physical writing of the book, because I had all of that information, was, was about a year. And so I was doing other things uh, uh, doing that year as well, doing presentations. I, I did some more uh, performing. I did some other freelance writing. but. Because again, you need to go away and refresh yourself. You can't concentrate right. on, you know, all work and no play makes Jim a dull boy. So, but it, it took it took a year to to get that done. Mm -hmm. It goes back to like the, um, you said you like whichever job you're not doing currently. Yes, that's very <laughs> that's very true. That's very true, and uh, it, it's still true. We're, we're doing this, but I will say one thing. We're doing this interview, and I can't imagine anywhere else I would like to be right now than doing this interview. I can't, I can't imagine, yes, it would be better to uh, be sleeping, uh, you know, on the bed in the suite. It would be better to go to Malarkey's, and, uh, which I understand have great hamburgers, and that's why people go to Malarkey's, is because of the great hamburgers. Of course. But hamburgers. Uh, I can't think of any place I would rather be at this moment than, than right here and uh, answering these questions, because as an interviewer, you've done a tremendous um, amount of uh, homework. You, you would be surprised. Some interviewers, it's like, do you even know who I am? Do you even know that I wrote a book? It, 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 in fact, didn't you spend the summer reading my book? I did. I took the book everywhere with me. It's kind of bent up, so don't be mad at me. But <laughs> <laughs> I took it everywhere, and I read, I read all the stories. Um, I actually, some of my favorite stories I started off with, I would just flip the book open and mm -hmm. start reading um, wherever, wherever my finger landed pretty much. And my favorite story was, I didn't know about all the figurines. Oh. That, that was probably my favorite story out of all of them. Well, I'm glad you in, enjoyed the book, and that's why the book was written. You know, when you say a 400-page book, it's like 400 pages. When am I going to have time? So that's why I divided it up into, into separate stories. stories. They, they run about 8 to 10 pages each, so it, it's great to read on an airplane or when you're standing in line and whatever. And, you know, other people have told me that, too. They said, well, I bought the book because I was just interested in these stories, and they read those stories first, and then they went and read all the other stories mm -hmm. because they, they had uh, fun with that. And no, that, that, that's, that's fine that the book is bent up. You, you know that the book has, it's so thick, you can use it as a doorstop, uh, you can use it to stop a zombie attack. If you throw it, you know, hard enough, it, it should disable a zombie, especially if he stops to read it. But, um, and so in the second book, I'll make sure to put in zombie stories okay, so we can, we can do that. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, one of the stories is also kind of starts back at the beginning in Marceline, Missouri. Yes, um, we, which, is, which is nearby to, to here, I understand. It's nearby to close is it? Iowa. Well, it, it must I'm be pr pretty close because they have an event called Toon Fest and they said, oh, well, you're in Iowa. You could just drive to, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to Marceline. And I thought, is that one of those drives where you get in the on the car and you just drive forever and ever and ever and ever and then forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? And then maybe you'll get there. Maybe, okay. 
So I, I don't know much about Midwest geography, but what about Marceline, Missouri, would you like to know? Um, where everything started, where Walt started, and um, a little bit about Roy, because um, surprisingly enough, I had to do my research to find out about Roy, because even I didn't, I didn't know about him. He's not... He's not out there as much as it's always Walt Disney, Walt mm -hmm. Disney. And, and Walt and Roy were both uh, a wonderful team uh, together. But yes, uh, Roy purposely wanted to avoid the uh, spotlight so his younger brother uh, could uh, uh, take focus. Um, yes, the Disney family, uh, Elias and uh, Flora Disney, had uh, five children. Uh, they had a farm on uh, Marceline and uh, that they were working. They had um, uh, four sons, uh, Herbert, uh, Raymond, uh, Roy, Walt, and then a, uh, a little sister, Ruth. Um, and there was quite a gap between the first three and the last uh, uh, two. Uh, Herbert went on to be a uh, mailman. Uh, and uh, actually, he went on to be a mailman in Glendale, California. So my um, first grade teacher at Thomas Edison Elementary School in Glendale, California was Margaret Disney, who was Herbert's second wife. And she was a younger wife, mm -hmm. but uh, she was teaching first grade. And what I did is I went and I grabbed a sheet uh, of easel paper and I drew a picture of Jiminy Cricket, because that was my favorite character at the time, because Jiminy and Jimmy, that was close enough. <laughs> and so I drew a picture of Jiminy Cricket and gave it to her in the hopes she would take it to the Disney studio and I would be hired immediately so I wouldn't have to learn my multiplication tables <laughs> in the third grade. But portfolio review was backed up for decades, apparently, before I got a job at Disney. And yes, I had to do multiplication, but I still don't know those tables today. <laughs> uh, the second brother was Raymond, and he was an insurance salesman. And if um, people want to know what Raymond actually looked like, he was the basis for the character Honest John in Pinocchio with the cigar, and he was a <laughs> flim-flam artist, and he was as, as an insurance salesman. And then there was Roy Disney, who was uh, very quiet, um, very studious, very disciplined, very responsible. And there was an eight-year uh, gap between Roy and Walt, so uh, they developed a, a, a real closeness, an older brother and uh, a younger brother. And then Ruth was just the little tag-along sister <laughs> that you tease and, and you get into trouble and uh, uh, all of that. And so uh, Walt and Roy uh, were the ones who primarily worked on the farm because the two older brothers felt the work was just, you know, too hard. They didn't like being told what to do. And so they ran away from home, found other jobs. And so Elias was stuck running this huge farm with these, with these two young boys. Um, and then um, Elias got sick, so they needed to move because they couldn't maintain the farm. And they moved to Kansas City, Missouri and uh, where Walt went to school and Roy went to school and uh, both of them worked a newspaper uh, route. Um, and uh, around that time uh, was World War I and Roy was old enough that he signed up for the Navy. And uh, Walt saw him in that uniform and just fell in love with that because he looked so patriotic and all that. And so Walt tried to sign up but uh, Walt was too young. Walt was only 16 years old, so they, they wouldn't uh, accept him. And so what Walt did was he forged his birth certificate. He got his birth certificate. He was born in 1901, and the, uh, it, it still e exists. Um, and you see where he took a pen and changed the one into a zero, so it's <laughs> 1900. So he was 17 years old, according to that. And uh, he got a job as an ambulance driver for the Red uh, Cross over in France. And so he shipped out there and actually celebrated his 17th birthday uh, in France. And then when he came back, um, his father wanted him to go into the uh, jelly factory business and, and all that. And Walt didn't want to do that. He was now 19 years old. And by golly, he's a man. And, and of course, many of the 19-year-olds who were listening to this, know, know that feeling, you know, I'm 19 years old, I know what I'm doing, I wish those old people would just die and get out of the way and let me take over the world now. Um, and so he started his own animation company called Laughograms. 
And uh, actually, they're pretty good. Uh, they've all survived uh, today, which is interesting because 90% uh, of all films made before 1940 no longer exist in any form whatsoever because they were done on nitrate, so very combustible, so they were destroyed. But all of those laughograms uh, from uh, 1919, 1920 still exist. But what was happening, he was not a good businessman, so he signed a very bad contract that he wouldn't get paid until six months after the films were delivered, and uh, he charged the price of what it cost him to make the film, no overhead to cover uh, staff or invest in another. And so by the age of 20, he was bankrupt. And so his advice uh, to uh, 19 and 20 year olds is, uh, it's good to have a strong failure when you're young because you learn that you can survive it and you can get up and you can walk away. And it's also good to have a failure when you're young because people will look at you and go, oh, they're young. They, they'll, they'll learn. Whew, that, that makes me that, feel that's better. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> See, in, in the position I'm in, they, they go, he's old enough to know better. Why did he do that? So it's like, no, I'm not. What are you doing? Um, so uh, Walt um, decided to go to California. Uh, his brother Roy was in a veteran's hospital because uh, uh, Roy had picked up tuberculosis. And so in those days, they shipped folks to a drier climate so that it would dry out the lungs and all that. And uh, Walt walked into the hospital and he said, I'm going to start an animation company. You need to sign yourself out of here. And Come sure on, enough, we're going. We're doing it. <laughs> we're doing it. And so Roy signed himself out and walked out of the hospital the next day. And uh, Walt and Roy uh, lived together uh, for a period of time. It was really an odd couple relationship. Uh, Walt was very messy. Roy was very neat. Um, and they started the Disney Brothers Studio. And what is interesting about that is after the first couple of years, it was Roy who said, let's call it the Walt Disney Studio. Giving Walt yes, credit. Yes, absolutely. Because there were other brother studios. There were the Warner Brothers and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so they started doing an, um, an animation series called the Alice Comedies where they had this little six-year-old girl, Virginia Davis, who I, uh, who I interviewed. She just passed away a year or two ago. And they had her in a cartoon background. So she uh, was interacting with all these cartoon characters and, and having adventures in the Wild West and um, under the sea and the whole bit. Very, very uh, popular. Dozens of those films made. And uh, so popular that it started another series called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. <laughs> And a lot of people don't know this, but thanks to the people listening to this interview, they'll know that. Why he was a lucky rabbit, it's because he had four lucky rabbit's feet. That's why he was a lucky rabbit, because he had a lucky rabbit's foot on each foot. And um, <laughs> what happened is, again, Walt didn't look closely enough at the contract, so Charles Mintz, uh, who was distributing the films, copyrighted the character in his name, copyrighted the films in his name, and so when Walt went to ask for more money because he wanted to experiment, by golly, Charles Mintz said, not only do I own the character in the films, but I knew you were coming out to ask for more money, so I sent my brother, who's a lawyer, on the train that passed yours, and he's hired every one of your artists. I offered them a higher salary than what you were paying, so every one of your artists except Ub Iwerks is now working for me. And so then what happened is on the train trip back from New York, uh, Walt came up with the idea of Mortimer Mouse. I was just going to ask. Mortimer Mouse. And his wife Lillian, who is with him, said, Mortimer, oh, that's, a, that's a terrible name for a mouse. You know, make it something shorter. Make it something more friendly. So it was Mickey Mouse. So when he got off, the train in Hollywood, he had a new character, and he only had one animator, Ub Iwerks. And it's 24 drawings for each second of film. A good animator, a good animator at Disney, could turn out maybe 10 or 20 usable drawings per day. Ub Iwerks was the type of artist who could turn out 200 drawings a day. Oh my goodness. He would sit down and he would start with the first drawing and then go to the second and the third and the fourth and fifth. There was no in-betweening. He did all of that. And so Ub did the uh, first Mickey Mouse cartoon. And everybody thinks that that's uh, uh, Steamboat Willie, but it wasn't. It was plain crazy. 
where Mickey and Minnie are in a, in a plane and Mickey is trying to get a kiss from Minnie. That's why he's taking her up in the plane. So she has to kiss him or else, you know, my gosh, where are you going to go? Well, she doesn't put up with that. She slaps him and jumps out of the plane <laughs> and uses her underwear as a parachute to, to get back down. And then they made another film called Galloping Gaucho, which was a uh, parody of a Douglas Fairbanks silent film. But people took a look at this and they said, why should we take these cartoons? There's nothing different in it than any other cartoons that are out there. So the third cartoon that was made was Steamboat Willie. And it had synchronized sound, which meant that the sound related to what was happening on the screen. So if the steamboat whistle opened, you heard the steamboat whistle sound. And sound was also used for a comedy device. So uh, when he, Mickey opened the mouth of a cow and uh, uh, hit each of the teeth, it, it sounded like a xylophone. Now those of you who grew up in Iowa know that that doesn't happen with real cows, but uh, it got a big laugh and it was the first cartoon with synchronized sound and it was a huge hit and um, so when Walt said it all started with a mouse, it really was. That was truly the beginning of uh, the Disney studio and the Disney company and all of the animation. And good old Mickey, he's been around since 1928. Wow, 1928. Now, now you weren't around then, right? Um, Not a gleam in your, in your parents' eyes. No, I don't believe so. Okay. So we have Mickey Mouse, um, Walt and his wife Lillian, mm -hmm. correct? Um, Roy had, and his wife Edna. Right. Um, Walt and Lillian had Diane and Sharon. Right. Um, now what influence did they have? Okay. And uh, one of the things, too, is um, they had uh, Diane, and uh, that was 1933, and, and it was a difficult birth, and basically the doctor said, uh, you really shouldn't try another pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so they adopted a child, Sharon. But uh, they, even though they told Sharon she was adopted, you didn't publicize it in those days. Right. That was not considered and, uh, uh, appropriate. And um, the children had a, had a huge influence because uh, Walt would bring home the cartoons from the studio to show them, and they would go, oh, that's boring. <laughs> so he <laughs> we had, don't like that. So he, so he had to come up with, with other things to do. But uh, Saturday was always Daddy's Day with the kids. And so um, to bond with his daughters, he would take them out and he would take them out to circuses and little parks and a carousel out at uh, Griffith Park. And, uh, but one of the things Walt noticed as he was sitting there on the bench and they were riding the carousel and Walt had actually bribed the person on the carousel so that Sharon and Diane would always get the brass ring and they reached <laughs> out to grab it from the horse. Walt thought, you know, there should be a place where, a, you know, a, a father, a parent, and his kids could have fun together. And that didn't exist, you know, because there were amusement parks, but amusement parks were designed to separate people. You know, the roller coasters, that's where the young people went. There were little itty bitty kitty rides that were only big enough for a child, you know, to, to be in. And oftentimes the parents 